We've heard a lot from some national speakers today, um, which we were very fortunate to do, Kate Gerson and Eric Hirsch. But we really wanted to localize the conversation. And so for this portion of the day, we have invited some local Wisconsin educators to come in and talk about their experiences with high quality instructional materials and professional learning. So at this time, we're going to introduce three different educators from three very different school districts. We're going to hear from them one at a time. I will ask them a question and uh, they will, you'll be able to hear from them. So first I'm going to invite Jennifer Thayer. Hi Jennifer. <laughs> so first I'm gonna ask you to tell Wisconsin who you are, what your role is, what your school district is. I'm Jennifer Thayer. Um, my role is superintendent in the New Glarus School District, and I have been in that role for five years. Great, thanks. And Jennifer, can you talk a little bit about what the process around, or where the conversation around high quality instructional materials and professional learning, what, what's that conversation been like in New Glarus? Sure, we've done a lot of work on high quality materials in New Glarus. Um, we, when I started about five years ago, we had a wide range of curriculum materials. We had everything from completely teacher-built materials to very scripted materials. So we were a wide range across the district. Some was new, some was old. Um, and after about two years there and watching teachers work really, really, really hard, um, I said to the teachers, we need to think about looking at high quality materials. Um, right about that time, Ed Reports was coming out with all of the reviews, and what we were finding was that we continued to have gaps in our, when we looked at subgroups of students. We also found that we had, when we looked at our data, our reading scores just weren't budging. We were known as a really good district, we're a district of choice. Um, we wanted to go from good to great, and we were just not seeing those scores budging. And so we decided that it was time to really look at materials. And so I actually remember the email, or um, actually memo, I sent out to our K-12 ELA team and said, you're doing great work. I see you working so hard, you're trying to align standards, you're trying to make this all work but all the work you're doing is also making you frustrated. And I look at the scores and you look at the scores and we're not seeing a bunch. And so I said that Ed Reports had come out with these reviews and I really wanted them to at least look at it. Just take a chance and see what's out there and then we can go from there. Um, talk to um, different uh, reps from the different companies. We can bring them in, we can pilot things, but at least let's consider it. And that was the beginning of our journey, and our journey has gone faster than I ever expected. Um, in ELA, I'll talk just real brief about our elementary. Um, our elementary had a pilot team that got together, and they just ran. They said, we do need to look at materials. They got together, and they started looking at those materials. They um, brought in reps. They looked at ed reports. They looked at a variety of different um, materials that were available and ultimately um, decided to pilot one set of materials. We talked about piloting two, three, however many they needed to do and they were easily able to narrow it to one. They said, we think this is right for us. So they did, we spent a whole year piloting. That pilot included a ton of professional development. We had an instructional coach that worked with the staff. They, we had um, training that came in from the outside. We also had the teachers that weren't piloting go into those pilot rooms and see what was happening. And by mid-year, they said, we need to do this. This is the program for us and we need to adopt. And so we made that decision and moved forward. It also say that they were so excited about the process that they came to us and said, we really need to do this in math too. Um, so, both the elementary principal, curriculum director, and I said, do you know what you're getting yourselves into? This is a lot of work. You already are implementing a new ELA curriculum. Do you really want to pilot math on top of it? And they said, yes, absolutely. So, um, at this point this year, our elementary is implementing a new reading uh, ELA curriculum. And on top of it, our, we have a pilot group piloting a new math curriculum. And they're energized and excited. Um, 
I didn't know going into it if that's where we would land, but that's where we're at, and it's an exciting place to be. On the other hand, our middle and high school are kind of flipped. Um, they actually already adopted high quality materials in math, and we are in the process of piloting in um, ELA. So we did a little bit of a flip, but as of next year, we anticipate being able to um, have a fully implemented high quality materials across the entire district, ELA and math, um, for K-12. And so we're excited about where we've been, really excited about where we're headed. Um, I won't say it's always easy. There are bumps in the road. Um, there is a situation, actually just yesterday, um, our high school was piloting a program and it just wasn't working for them. Um, so they said, here's why it doesn't seem to fit us well. And we think we need to try to pilot this other program for the rest of the year. And we're on board and making that happen. And so we're about mid-year gonna switch and, and pilot the other program. So there's bumps, it's not an easy process, but we found that um, our teachers are really engaged in the process and they're really excited about what they're doing. Thanks so much. I think that um, the thing for me that's so powerful about the story in New Glarus is just how much you have involved your teachers uh, from the very beginning and how much you have really valued their, their opinions and the feedback that they have offered you all the way throughout the process. And that was key to our process. Yeah, absolutely. I, for me, that's, yeah, that's one of the big takeaways. Yeah, all right, thank you. So next we're going to hear from a principal, uh, Gail Lucky. So I'm gonna invite Gail into the speaker box here. And hi, so first I'm going to ask you to, again, start with telling us what is your name, what is your role, what's your school district, where are you from? Um, my name is Gail Lipke, I am the uh, 4K through 6th grade principal at Norwalk, Ontario, Wilton School District. Um, probably not many people know where that is, so it's about 20 miles south of Toma, about 45 minutes to an hour uh, east of La Crosse. So we're in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> And some people might know your school district by your acronym now, now, right? Yep, we are N O W. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And so, tell me, um, tell me a little bit about what the conversation has looked like, what it's been like regarding high quality <coughs> instructional materials and professional learning in Norwalk, Ontario, Wilton, from the principal perspective. Um, I started there about seven years ago, so our conversation started really with the standards and just getting familiar with the standards first before we even looked at anything. Um, so we really spent a year and a half looking at the standards, unpacking them, what do we have, what do we need. Um, we found that we needed a common language and um, we didn't have that so much. We were using different curriculum at different grade levels and it wasn't consistent across the board. So we um, really took a good look at the standards and then we started to look at um, what curriculum out there would be the best fit for us. We are a high poverty school district and we do have a significant amount of Hispanic students in our district. So high population of English language learners, right? Yeah. In your yeah. very small, very rural school district. Yeah. Um, half of the kids that came in last year um, as Hispanic students were right from um, Mexico or Guatemala and did not speak any English. So it's a, yeah. yeah. So for us, a really important part of our curriculum was that it had a Spanish component to it. So we had to look for that as well. Um, so we looked at, I asked for samples from different vendors. We looked at different things to see what was the best fit for us. Um, and as a school, we, we decided on what we would choose and um, started to implement that. So the process that we went through for that was the first year, I had the teachers completely teach it as it was written from the box. We wanted to go through and make sure that the standards were all in there. And if we're supplementing, it gets a little muddy. So we wanted to make sure that everything was in there um, as far as standards. So biweekly, the teachers grade level wise would get together and talk about their lessons and if they felt there were holes in the in the curriculum that we had. Um, and they really had to take a good look at, you know, which standards were being taught where. Um, and then 
about monthly, we would also cross team. So we would have the teachers meet part of their collaboration time with the grade above and part of the time with the grade below, so that we also had consistency and a smooth transition between grades and making sure that we weren't missing anything in between there. So that was a huge part of our, our learning process. Um, we brought in the, the vendors to do PD for us in the district. We also went through a lot of training actually at our CESA and uh, through Washburn and the teachers that would go to those trainings would come back and share with each other as well. So it was a learning community type of a endeavor and um, it's really worked well. We also did math and reading all at the same time. So <laughs> how we lived through that, I really don't know, but we did. And it was a good learning process for everybody. Um, and now we have a good idea of if we're, you know, if the standards are changing or anything like that, how we can start again and um, make sure that everything is fitting in the way that it needs to. And then, um, you know, one unexpected thing was the technology side of things. Um, poverty school, we don't have one-on-one -on -one technology. How is that going to look at our district and how often is that going to change? And are we going to have to repurchase materials so that we're up to date on the technology and it's working for us? Um, so that was a, a thing that we had to really look at too when we were looking at our, our curriculum. Yeah, so I imagine that uh, that kind of technology piece factored into your ultimate decision making. Yeah, about what materials you used. Yeah, we had to look at bandwidth and you know all these things that I had no clue about but <laughs> learned about quickly, um, and making sure that where we're located, we have the amount of um, bandwidth and, and um, resources that we can need for for using the materials the way they needed to be used. So yeah, that's a that's a constant. <laughs> I think the one thing that I most appreciate about uh, about your story, Gail, is the amount of time that you gave your teachers to collaborate. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that's, that's always one of our most scarce resources in education is the time that we that our educators have to collaborate. And so just the fact that you really that you really prioritize that and made sure that your teachers had time both to collaborate within their grade level and then vertically um, across grade levels as well to ensure the smooth transition for your students. That's I yeah, I think that's probably one of the best things that you that you could have done. I'm sure there are lots of folks um, across Wisconsin who would like to talk to you more about your scheduling magic. Oh so uh, <laughs> how uh, how you were able to make that happen sure. is my guess. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, and we can certainly put folks in touch with Gail um, or with any of our um, Wisconsin panel. Sure. With sure. what do you, would you say that there's a biggest lesson learned out of your experience that you would take into your next selection and adoption process? Um, just take your time, go through, there's no rush. You need to make sure that you're picking things that are best for your school. Just because it works for one school doesn't mean it's going to work for your school. You have to look at your students and your population and your staff and weigh all of that in to make sure that you're picking what's best for everybody involved. And then I would say also the education of the parents, you know, um, especially with math, as was discussed earlier, it isn't being taught the way we learned, it's not being taught the way the parents learned, so it's really vital. We invited them in and let them look through the resources and gave them a lot of um, the roadmap. I don't know where I found it, I think it was an EPA, it was a roadmap of what they would learn each grade. Um, we supplied them with that in English and in Spanish so that they had an idea of what was being taught so it wasn't so confusing for them and we didn't have the you know the ill saying about the new math and things like that so I think that was a really important component too. Absolutely great thanks. Thank Thank you. So the final member of our Wisconsin educator panel is Ken Davis and um, he's a uh, teacher and coach. So why don't you tell us who you are and what's your role, um, where you're at professionally? Uh, I'm Ken so Davis. I'm a mathematics teacher at Blunt Memorial High School. Um, this is a return trip to the classroom for me. Um, I took about five years out of the classroom and doing different positions in education. Um, I was a consultant at DPI, and most recently I was a mathematics coordinator for Madison Metropolitan School District. 
Great. So, uh, Ken, what, what can you share with us about your experiences with high quality instructional materials and professional learning? Well, that's a loaded question. But, yep. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think the biggest thing that uh, I can share um, with people is, and, and Kate talked about this too, that when we're talking about high quality instructional materials, we're also talking about an equity issue for uh, many students. Um, when I look around districts and, and I look at districts mission statements, a lot of times they will always say something about um, we're teaching math for all students or for every student, but you know, we can look at data and say that we're falling short of that. Um, I think one thing that high quality instructional materials bring with it is an opportunity to improve teacher quality at the same time as long as those two things are intertwined and not as if we're bringing one but not having the other one. I think it's very important that we do both of them at the same time. And I think by doing that, what happens is that you, you can alleviate some of those equity issues that we're running across because those teachers are really becoming better teachers because of the materials that they're using and because of the professional development that goes along with the teaching of those materials. I think it's very important that um, when you're bringing in high quality instructional materials, it's not the kind of thing where you drop off this box of materials to teachers in August and then you say, okay, we'll see you in June and hope, hope, hopefully everything goes well for you. But I think it's kind of, you have to have that professional development, um, those opportunities for teachers to meet in PLC groups that happens throughout the year and not just you know, quarterly, but it's almost this kind of thing that has to happen continuously. Um, if you're going to bring the quality of the teachers up to match the materials that they're that they're asked to deliver, there were some questions um, that we received around getting educator buy-in for materials. Um, can you talk about your experience with that? Yeah, um, I think what what's really important uh, to get educator buy-in is first of all. Um, as been said before, teachers or educators have to be part of the process in the very beginning. Um, I think the other thing that is very important is starting with a foundation and, and just simply asking teachers, where do they want their students to be? Like in mathematics, where do you want your students to be? What do you want them to be able to do? Starting with uh, a vision. Starting with a vision. Where yeah. do, what, do, what is it that you think about when you think about a student walking across the stage and I, and I teach high school, so in four years, where do I want that student to be? If you start there with your teachers, and most of the time that vision is the same. It's, it's not as if teachers come into it and say, well, you know, I don't want my students to be able to do mathematics. <laughs> uh, that's not normally what you hear, but you really hear about, I want my students to be able to do mathematics, I want them to be able to do mathematics well, and I want them to do mathematics at levels that haven't, students haven't reached before. And then I think the thing is then to get them to, I don't want to say trick teachers, but you almost get them to look at the materials or the newly adopted materials and say, and ask them, will these materials do that? Mm -hmm. And if you look at these and you look at like some of the tasks that are the newly developed tasks that are coming forward in mathematics and you ask them, will these tasks and these things get those students to that point? Then I think that's how you get that buy-in because teachers, again, don't have that time to, to really like dive in and be able to like create those tasks. So I think if, they, if you introduce them to those kinds of things, then I think if you have that shared vision, I think they will ask for those things and it won't be like you're, you're putting it on them. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. All right, thank you very much. Yep. So a big uh, thank you to our Wisconsin educators who were brave enough to uh, volunteer their time uh, in front of their colleagues across the state, near and far. At this time, we are going to uh, briefly transition to bringing our national speakers, Eric and Kate, back in order to respond to some of the questions that you have been submitting throughout the day, some of those questions and comments. We, and we very much uh, appreciate your engagement um, and your, your willingness uh, to participate in the conversation by sharing your thoughts and questions and feedback. We do want you to know that if there are any questions uh, that we that we don't answer, that you will probably see those the answers to those questions appear in a public frequently asked questions document. That's uh, really part of our intention is to collect your questions and your feedback and and make sure that we can share the answers so that everyone has access to those. So in just a moment, we'll return.